I think for a lot of parents it can feel challenging because it's something that they're maybe not as familiar with. So the generation of kids um, that are being born now and have been born in the last couple of years don't know a life without smartphones. Um, whereas for a lot of parents, not having a smartphone or for some not having a TV in their households growing up is kind of a normal or was a normal part of their childhoods. And so it can feel, I think, a little bit challenging sometimes when it's just not something that we're used to and it feels a little bit foreign for us. Whereas for our kids who are digital natives, it almost feels like they know all of these things or they're um, getting into things that we just maybe don't have the same grasp of. Um, so it can feel like I use an analogy um, of an onion and it can feel like a real added layer. So like there's that skin around the outside um, of the parenting journey. And what we're trying to do is help peel that back and get back to the core of the journey and connecting with kids. So I think sometimes for parents, it can feel like when we are parenting in the online world, like we need to know absolutely everything about every app and every platform and every device that our kids are using. And the reality is that that is impossible and it's never going to happen. Um, these things are forever changing. And as someone who works on apps and platforms and in this space every day. I still don't understand everything that goes on on the online world or in cyberspace. So taking that expectation of ourselves as a first step, I think it's really important. So really thinking about what it is that we would like to know about the online world. So as a parent, do we, how involved do we want to be in our child's online lives? If the involvement that we want to have kind of centers around uh, using parental controls and things like that, we need to know about the different parental controls for the apps and things that they're on. If our involvement centers around uh, having conversations and connecting with them about what they're doing online, then asking them lots of questions about what it is that they're up to, why they like a particular app, and staying really curious about what the, what the enjoyment that they get out of those things are. So there are heaps of different ways, like with anything um, in the parenting journey, there are heaps of different ways to be involved in our children's online lives. And I think that the important thing is about really considering ourselves, what that looks like for us and for our child, and then looking at ways to find out the information that we need to know to do that. When I talk to young people and kids about what they wish their parents knew about the digital world and their online lives, there are a couple of things that come up uh, for most of them. So one of the big ones is around not having devices confiscated if something bad happens to a child online. So a kind of classic example, I suppose, is, or an example that I've heard a couple of times is a young person will go to their parent or their carer and they'll express to them that they're experiencing bullying or that they're seeing bullying online and they're quite distressed about it. And as is the parent's role, they want to protect their child. They want to um, keep them safe from what's happening online. And so the kind of gut reaction and instant reaction can be to remove that device from the child because that's where the harm is coming from. So let's remove the device and then the harm won't be happening anymore. For us as adults and for parents, it feels like the logical step to take. But for kids, what it feels like is, I've told my parent that I'm in trouble. I've told my parent that I'm not safe. And instead of feeling supported, they feel almost betrayed, like they're getting into trouble for expressing that they're experiencing harm. And so one of the big things that young people talk about is around being included in those conversations around what's going to happen next if they are expressing for example, they've seen something distressing online or they're experiencing something negative. So really asking them 
what is it that you would like from me in this situation? And it's not always going to be worded like that in a conversation, but kind of keeping that child's interests and needs at the center of the conversation, trying to find out from them whether they just need support. Maybe they just need a hug. Maybe they need someone to vent to. Maybe they need ideas or maybe they do want you to go with them to their school or they want your help reporting the matter to eSafety or to the platform that it's happening on. So that's probably the biggest thing um, that children and young people talk about. I think the other thing to keep in mind as well, and this kind of comes back to peeling back that outer layer, is that if the online world is something that our kids are interested in, they want us to show an interest in it as well. So having those open conversations doesn't just have to be when something's gone wrong or when they're upset about something. It can be generally about what they're doing. So asking them questions around what their favorite game is and why and what happens in it and things like that can really promote that connection and communication between um, between them and between you so that when something does go wrong, you've already established that relationship where they know they can come to you and that you're a safe space to be open and honest with about what's going on for them. So that is definitely something as well that young people want. They want their parents to be interested. I think I often liken it back to, you know, when I was a young person or I, when I was a child, um, my brother and I would make up ridiculous games out on the trampoline or on our street. And we loved telling our parents every single detail about those games that we made up. And it's no different for kids now. They want to be able to tell their parents about all of the little ins and outs of the games that they're playing. So I think having those conversations with kids from the time that they're getting onto devices and even before that, when they're playing with your devices or other people's devices, having those conversations can be really useful to set them up for the future and set up that relationship with them um, down the line as well. So when kids are ready to get on devices and when we're ready for them to be spending more time on devices, whether that's unsupervised or they've got their own device or any of those kinds of things, it's really important to have a conversation with them if they're developmentally kind of at the level where they can um, have input. That's amazing as well to allow them to have input into these conversations. But we want to sit down and have a conversation as a household about what the boundaries around devices are going to look like. And that's going to be different depending on the age of the children, depending on the devices that are in the home, and depending on what we and they feel comfortable with. So it's never too early to start with setting boundaries and it's also never too late. So some of the things might uh, include things about time spent online. So whether there is a particular amount of time that they're going to be allowed to spend um, online each day or uh, each week. Uh, it might be time spent on particular apps or platforms so they can only play uh, Roblox, for example, for two hours a day or an hour a day or different on the weekends. But sitting down and having those conversations all together can be really useful to understand what they would like as well. So one of the great things about setting boundaries is, again, it really sets us up for these opportunities to have conversations with our kids about what they're doing online and to understand better what it is that they enjoy about their time online and what they want more of. So in some households, uh, people might find it really useful when they're setting boundaries to write everything down. So when you're sitting down and agreeing on the different rules that different people in the family um, will have applying to them, for example, for some kids, it can be really, really helpful to have the list like on the fridge or somewhere where everyone sees it. Um, and the boundaries can apply for parents too. So I think one of the really interesting things to come out of some of the research is that kids also want boundaries to be applying to their parents. So I think a really great example of something like that would be if you all want to agree that uh, each night you sit down and have dinner together as a family 
or when you're watching movies together, everyone is off all of their other devices so that you have that undivided attention as to what's going on. And taking it back to the connection that I was talking about earlier, it can be really awesome if you are sitting down in those times without your devices to connect about what you're doing on them. So asking your kids at dinner or at breakfast or whenever suits your household, you know, what's the best thing that you've seen online in the last week or what's the uh, funniest thing that you've seen online in the last week. Um, or even setting times where you share those things together as a family. So you sit down and you watch everyone in the household's favorite YouTube video from the past week, for example, or their favorite TikTok, or you have a family group chat where everyone can share those things. Um, Boundaries as well, I think, need to be flexible. So it's important that kids know that as they get older, those boundaries are going to change and that they understand the process for having those things changed. So they might be allowed to have, let's say they're allowed to have one hour of social media time a day. And as they're getting older, they're really wanting to spend more time on social media um, or on a particular platform, for example. So having the opportunity to come to you and say, hey, I really want us to revisit this and have a conversation around what that looks like and be able to ask them questions about why they think that that's fair. Why do they want that change to happen? I think can be a really great way to keep them involved in the process. So not so much when they're really, really young and they're perhaps watching Bluey or Play School or something like that, but as they start to get older, making sure that they feel empowered to come to you and ask for those changes. It can also be really useful for parents and carers when they are setting boundaries in their household to consider their own device use as part of that process. So thinking about what it is that we use our devices for in the household and what kind of behaviours we're modelling to our children. One of the things that is really interesting is that kids often report that when they see their parents on their phones or their computers, they automatically assume essentially that their parents are on social media. And so one of the things that uh, parents and carers can do to, I guess, normalize the fact that there are other things that they're doing on their phones and their devices is say or answer questions when when their children are saying, you know, what are you doing? Oh, I'm paying the rent or I'm just responding to an email. Particularly when children are very, very young, I think it's an important thing to consider as a parent as to how much time we're spending on our devices around them. One of the things that we often talk about but that doesn't have a lot of research behind it yet is looking at how children attach to us as parents if there's a phone in the way, kind of interrupting that connection between our facial expressions and theirs. There's a huge amount of information that's available. Unfortunately, it's not really concrete yet. But it is important to consider as a parent, how much time am I spending on my device? And is that eating into the time that I could be spending with my child? Or is it eating into the time that we could be connecting with one another? And thinking about what that would look like in your household. So for example, some people who I've spoken to, they're the rules or boundaries that apply to the kids also apply to the parents. So for example, if the kids are uh, not allowed to have devices at the dinner table, again, parents also aren't allowed to have devices at the dinner table. Um, Same with uh, things like devices in the bedroom. Some families really like having all of the devices get charged in a central location and they don't get used overnight or not using devices in that half an hour to 45 minutes before bed. 
um, can be a really great thing for kids to get them to sort of wind down for bedtime, but it can also be really great for us. As most of us know, blue light can really interfere with our sleep and the quality of the sleep that we get. So thinking about what the boundaries are that we might put in place for ourselves. I know for me personally, something that I really enjoy is going for walks or runs where I don't take my phone and I don't look at a device the whole time. And I just kind of have that separation time from my device. Again, that's going to look different for everyone, but if we're asking our children to have boundaries around their device use and to have some of those rules in place, I think it's important that we have some in place for ourselves as well. One of the most important things I think to remember is that the online world is our kids' social world. It offers them the opportunity to connect with other people. And as human beings, we are just social beings. I think that it does look very different from perhaps when we were all kids and we were out on our bikes until the streetlights came on or whatever we were kind of getting up to. It does look different, but the reality is, is that what they're really doing is pretty much exactly the same. They're connecting with other people. They're engaging in relationships. One of the analogies that I like to draw as well that I think is really important is around whether online friends are real friends. And I talk about this idea that it can be really confusing for kids because to them, those people are their real friends. And if, for example, they've got a parent, a carer or an older sibling who is online dating, it can be really confusing to them to understand that that person has online friends who they uh, meet with and talk with in real life, um, but they're not allowed to have sort of friends and relationships that they make online. So I think having those conversations with kids around why that is, talking about physical safety and safety online is a really important thing to support them in learning more about the online world. Something that I also get asked about a lot is how we can identify when perhaps something has gone wrong for our children or when they're being exposed to something that's maybe not appropriate, that they haven't necessarily identified as being something that is or could be harmful to them. And I think a lot of this does come back to that connection and that open communication that we're trying to establish with our children and our teenagers. One of the things that I talk about specifically around this topic, though, is the importance of remembering that if this isn't a communication style that our family is used to, or it's not something that we've ever done before, we might not get the response that we're expecting from a teenager, especially. So if we're asking them questions around things like, oh, you know, I've noticed that you've been a lot more withdrawn recently, is everything okay? they may turn around and be like, what are you asking me about? I, we don't talk like this. I'm, I feel uncomfortable or I feel embarrassed. And they may not want to engage in those conversations. When we are talking about them and we are getting those responses that we maybe don't expect, they're not opening up to us about everything that's going on for them. It's important, again, for us to take a deep breath, take a moment to de-stress, relax, and then go forward in the conversation and be honest with them about the fact that this might be something new that you're trying with them. This might feel a little weird and maybe even a little clunky at first, but it is just the new thing or the way that we're trying to engage with them about what they're doing. Some of the signs that we might notice as parents or carers of something negative that our child is experiencing online are essentially around changes in their personality or the way that they engage with you or other people that would be really unexpected. So we might notice them withdrawing a lot 
or perhaps they're doing the opposite. They're coming and spending a lot more time with you or um, other family members. They might be spending a lot more time on their devices, but equally they might be spending a lot less time on their devices because they're trying to avoid the situation that's going on. Unfortunately, there's no specific concrete sign that something is happening for our children. But the really important thing is to have those conversations and to let them know that if there is anything, they can talk to you about that. One of the really great places to find out more information about the online world is eSafety. So they've got things for different age groups as well as specifically for parents and carers about all of the apps and platforms that uh, children and young people commonly use. Um, and they've also got information about some of the different things that might go wrong online and how to deal with those things. One of the fantastic things that they do as well is that you can report things into them. For example, for cyberbullying. So if a child or young person is experiencing cyberbullying online and they have reported it to the platform and nothing seems to be happening, the material's not getting taken down for whatever reason, they can also report it to eSafety. So as a parent or carer, you can either support your child and do that with them, which again is another really fantastic opportunity to connect with them and support them through the situation that they're in or you can do it on their behalf. So you can submit on their behalf. Again, in those situations, my recommendation and eSafety's recommendation would always be to have them in the room, sitting next to you, able to answer all of the questions with you rather than doing it for them. If you have any questions or if you're overwhelmed by the amount of information that's available out there, ParentLine is available every day of the year. You can chat to a qualified counsellor about anything to do with your child's online wellbeing, anything to do with your own online wellbeing, and they'll really take you through some of the different options and tools that will be available to support both you and your child. Again, I think the really important thing when it comes to the questions about the online world is bringing it back to what is it that our child wants and how can we help to empower them to get the resolution that they want. So if they want to go to their school, for example, and put in a formal complaint there, um, supporting them to take that step, or again, if they would like to report to eSafety, supporting them with that. Um, a couple of the other options might be looking at them speaking to a counsellor, whether that's through Kids Helpline or through another service, really thinking about what it is that they want and how we can support them to do that. So my key points are that it's okay not to be an expert when it comes to the online world. It's not about knowing the ins and outs of every app and platform. It really is about the connection between you and your child or your children. The process of getting to the agreements and things like that is often more important than the agreement itself. And finally, there is support available for you and for your children. Thank you.